mother, when she was pregnant, got into a time of prayer and God revealed to her that it was supposed to be the younger who was supposed to receive the blessing. But because of family conflict, the mother did not reveal this thing to the man of the house who was actually the priest who carried the anointing. That is not my point. My point is what actually happened when Jacob was so desired of receiving the anointing that was supposed to be for his brother. In the physical, it looked like Esau was the one who was supposed to take the anointing. But because of the spiritual insight that the mother had, the mother knew that the blessing was supposed to come to Jacob. And many of us have, have read this story a few times or lots of times, and we always thought that the problem was actually Jacob. But today I want to challenge your theology a little bit. And that is what we are talking about, the Esau syndrome. Esau syndrome basically means a situation where a man undermines the weight of spiritual realities to satisfy an immediate or temporal lust. This is what happens. People were saying that Jacob deceived them. Jacob did not necessarily deceive them. Jacob was smart and intelligent. Because if you look at Genesis 25, verse 29 to um, 34 that I was talking about, Jacob was there. He's always desired to receive this. And then Esau came from outside. And Jacob at that time was preparing a meal. I'm sure it was probably Aosakoku and some Kose, if, 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 if you are from my side of the world. And that was what was going on. So when Esau came, Jacob only wanted to take advantage of the guy's um, lack of self-control. And Esau syndrome is what I am calling this because it is the situation where a man will undermine a spiritual reality because of something he wants to satisfy immediately. Some people call it impulse. Impulse is something you've not planned for. And why am I saying that? Esau deceived himself because people thought that it was rather Jacob that deceived him. This was self-deception in the sight of Esau because Esau agreed on the terms that Jacob gave him that he would give the birthright to him. Jacob said, and he did not mean words. He didn't hide anything from his brother. He told his brother that, you know what? I'm going to give you a part of my food to eat because you claim you are hungry. But for me to give it to you, swear that you will give me or you will sell your birthright to me. So in my own estimation, which of course I stand to be corrected, I think and I believe that Jacob did not hide anything um, in the transactional uh, deal that he had with his big brother, which was Esau at the time. Because Esau presented an opportunity. I'm hungry, give me food to eat. And this was Jacob that needed to take advantage of the birthright. So he said, okay, fine, I have the food. If I have to give you this food to eat, then my, my brother sell your birthright to me. And Esau agreed. Esau agreed. And why am I saying that? Esau deceived himself. He deceived himself because he agreed casually. Because he was hungry and he needed to give this thing out so that his brother would actually be, be able to give him some of the food to eat. But behind uh, Esau's mind, he knew that he was lying to his brother. Why am I saying that? If you journey along the uh, verses that follow, you get to a point that when Esau finally realized that his father Isaac had blessed Jacob already. He started to weep. And then that is where my question is. Why are you weeping if you did not actually believe what you were saying? So then you get to the point and you, uh, this is my um, word actually, the Esau syndrome is being defined critically here. It meant that when Esau was telling Jacob that what is best, right? After all what? I am hungry. I need to eat so that I will be able to um, stay alive. I don't really care about the birth, right? Take it. He was actually lying. He was deceiving his brother because if he wasn't lying, when he came and his father told him that, you know what? I'm about to go and be with my fathers. So go and kill for me a venison and I'll bless you. He should have told his father that, dad, you know what? I've already given it to um, Jacob. So just call him and bless him. But that was not what the gentleman did. So in his mind, he was deceiving his younger brother. You know what? Just give me this thing and uh, at the back of my mind, when it's time, I will still go and take uh, my blessing, which is the best right, which is my bona fide right. But one thing I want us to note here is that whenever deception takes place, there is a spirit that works hand in hand with deception, and that is called the spirit of murder. Why am I saying murder? Immediately, Esau realized that his father had already released the birthright onto his younger brother. The Bible said he hated him and he wanted to even kill him. 
that was when um, the mother had to come and find a way so that this gentleman called Jacob will run away to um, Laban's house. You see the beauty of it. You were doing something that you thought it was uh, momentarily. You were actually deceiving your brother so that he would give you food to eat because you could not hold your immediate impulse. You couldn't deal with your temporal lust and desires. My question to you today is, how many of you have sold um, spiritual things for temporal things? How many of us have bargained with the devil for things that we need in the immediate? How many of us have become impulsed with our decisions and sold spiritual realities? God has called you and raised you to be an apostle, but you find your head on the lap of Delilah because you needed to satisfy your immediate cravings of sex. May God deliver somebody today. I know I am speaking to somebody today because God will not just bring us together for casual talks. When you go to the stadium and you hear people shouting, it's because their favorite team is winning. When you come to the gathering of the saints and you hear somebody shouting, it is because we are pulling down the walls of Jericho. I know that some wall of Jericho is falling. I know that some wall of Jericho is falling in your life in the name of Jesus. Today, whatever you are bargaining with the devil, understand that you are deceiving yourself. The devil will only offer you that temporal lust or that temporal desire, but what he's stealing from you is eternal. Adam and Eve did not know that it was more than just an apple, but it was the glory of God that they had, that, was, that the devil was after. You see, they were so ignorant. The man that they were dealing with, the Lucifer they were dealing with, used to be in Eden. So when God created the Garden of Eden and put them there, the, the man knew what Eden was. Eden is not actually a physical place. Eden is actually an embodiment of the glory of God. So when Lucifer saw that God was molding clay and putting, I mean, and putting that clay in that place that he used to be, that he has been cast out, he was filled with anger and bitterness. So what can I do that these people will lose this glory? And because he knew what he did to be cast out, he knew that if I can replicate it, I'll get these people. What did Satan do? He rebelled through disobedience. So he knew that if I can cause man to disobey, he will also fall in the same trap of disobedience and then he will be cast out. Lo and behold, when that thing happened, man was thrown out of the garden of Eden and man lost their glory. That is how very skillful the enemy is. So Bible warns us that we should not have a dialogue with the devil. We should resist him and he will flee. Don't deceive yourself and think that you are too intelligent. The devil does not understand English language. Neither the devil speaks Spanish or the devil speaks Italian. What the devil understands is the word of God. So when the devil went and met Jesus on the mountain when he was fasting, it was not English language Jesus was speaking. All Jesus said was, it is written. How much of the word of God do you know? Don't deceive yourself and be jumping here and there thinking that you are smart. Oh, let me entertain this girl. You know this girl is coming to cause you to fall, but you can deceive yourself and think that you can rise above it. My brother, you've not been called to negotiate with the devil. You've been called to flee. Are you more spiritual than Paul? When Paul said, flee from temptation, you want to be able to find your way around temptation. May God deliver us today. So the first one we've just looked at is what I call the Esau syndrome when we exchange or bargain spiritual weights or realities for things that are carnal or for things that are temporal. Young man, this woman that you are following is telling you that if you don't follow me, I will not open the doors for you to be able to be employed. You look at that temporal moment and the fact that you have to get a job to do and then you defile yourself and the devil shuts the door to the amazing thing God is trying to do in your life. Is it not amazing? The moment you finish doing that, the devil that was with you, that helped you to do that, will leave you alone and go and stand behind and say, God, you see, this guy is not fit for where you are taking him. That is why he's called the accuser of the brethren. The second thing I want to look at, which is another type of self-deception, is what I call the deception on relying on the horizontal. In life, we have the horizontal, and we have the vertical. When I talk about relying on the horizontal, it's got to do with things that are available, the going concern, all the indices. So if you look at what the world is going through now, the world is going through a lot of economic crisis. 
So the horizontal is telling you that, look at the GDP, look at the CPI, look at the inflation, look at which country is producing wars and all of that. That is the conditions of the physical. But there is a deception that can make you feel strong because you are able to calculate all these indices. And that is what I want to center on. I'm going to mix that up with the fact that not all men are the same. So the second deception I'm mixing to that you should not rely on the horizontal conditions alone and also pay attention to the fact that not all men are the same. Why am I saying that not all men are the same? Or why am I saying that don't consider the horizontal alone? There was a time, David was a mighty warrior. David was raised in the house of um, 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 Saul when Saul was king. God had made him privy to the fact that he had to um, go into seven in the um, palace so that he will know what his future is. And I'm going to come to a point which is very important. I'm praying that there will be time to actually digest that one very well. It's called service. Because you cannot go to any place God has not shown you already. And most of us have become victims to that thing in our day to day. So there was a time that everything was against David. Saul was on his heels and he wanted to kill him. And this guy had been put uh, as the head of a, a group of soldiers. And Bible makes us understand in First Samuel that he was so skillful that any time they went to battle, the way and the fury at which he would, he would defend Israel was amazing. Everybody was talking about this guy. This guy was a dangerous warrior. But there was this time. If you look at First Samuel chapter 19 from the verse 18 to 24, there was a time that Saul was on his heels. Saul de decided that I must kill this guy at all costs. And the reason was that the favor of God was on him. And at that time, David had married the daughter of Saul called Michal. So Michal got the uh, intel that David has sent soldiers, uh, I mean, soldiers had been sent to their, ham, their house to kill David and make sure that the guy will not leave the next day. So the intel was that, Husband, if you want to be alive tomorrow, then you have to escape tonight. The guy escapes. And I was thinking, if you escape, go and gather your loyal soldiers and everything and begin to fight because soldiers have been sent to fight you. Why don't you go and fight them back? But this is what he did. That is why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make you understand that you don't only rely on the horizontal. At that time, David did not rely on the fact that he was a skillful soldier. He didn't rely on the fact that he had led a lot of garrison to win battles. But what did he do? Bible said, David runs to Samuel in Naoth in Ramah. So Samuel was in Ramah. It was a, there was a town there where Samuel was. And don't forget, Samuel was the one who anointed David as king. And so you can put it side by side and say, probably say a spiritual father, which we are, we, like most of us have issues with. But for the sake of today's study, let's just call Samuel the spiritual father of David. So David runs to Samuel. And I am being pursued. I, people want to kill me. Why would I run to a prophet? The prophet does not have a sword. He doesn't have a gun. He doesn't fight um, physical battles. But David understood that it gets to a point in life, you don't have to deceive yourself by looking at the economic indices because there are a lot of economic challenges. No, you must go beyond that. So then he decides to go to his spiritual father. And what did his spiritual father do? His spiritual father did not um, ask him to go and gather men. He started to chant in the Holy Ghost. So then Saul sent a first badge of um, soldiers to go and capture him. When they got there, they met Samuel leading a group of prophets that were chanting. And the spirit of God was so heavy in the atmosphere that it caught all of them. And they also started by prophesying. Another badge came and the third badge came and the story was the same. It got to a point, Saul was so furious, he decided to go himself. But at this time, Samuel and the rest of the prophets had been chanting in the Holy Ghost for so long that now the intensity of the power of God around their life had extended so far that Saul did not even have to get to where Samuel and David were. The Holy Ghost hit Saul far away before he could even realize what was happening to him. The Spirit of God carried him all the way. He started prophesying so many kilometers away from where they were. And I want you to understand that not all men are the same. Samuel is not an ordinary man. So if you make a mistake and you think that all men are the same, you are, you are deceiving yourself. There are men that stand before God. Samuel were men that had so much intercessory power that they could, they, they could actually protect a whole territory. What kind of grace do you need to pray that it will create a perimeter of power 
that somebody was coming to your home. You've not even seen the person face to face, but the person is met with the Holy Ghost, caught under the anointing. He prophesies all the way to your house and he could do nothing. So at that time, David, who was a very skillful soldier, was saved by the fact that Samuel was not an ordinary man. May we not take these things for granted. There was another man called Moses. And I want to quickly talk about Moses because I need to finish something down there, which is very critical to us young ministers that are coming up. Moses was also not an ordinary man. There was a time that um, the Israelites had to fight a war. And we all know that um, Joshua was uh, understanding Moses. And Joshua was a warrior, a soldier by training. So then Moses told Joshua that, young man, I'm going to the mountain top with Aaron and her. You go down there and begin to fight with your sword. If it was me, I would say, ah, master. But if there is a war, let's go down there and fight. Why are you running away to the mountain? I said, that is not enough. You are running away with your brother Aaron so that I should go and face the battle and die. Little did Joshua know that it is not about his skill. It is not about the men that he was using to fight. It was not even about the kind of ammunition he had. But Bible said, as long as the hands of Moses were lifted, the battle was in favor of the Israelites. How do you call such a man a normal man? Moses was not a normal man. If you look at him and you just um, take it for granted that he's an ordinary man like you, you are in trouble. Why is it that when Moses brought his hands down, the battle turned? Is it not the same Joshua leading the troops down there? Is it not the same ammunition that they are using to fight? Is it not the same soldiers that were down there? Nothing changed down there. Everything about the battle was constant. The only variable that determined the way the battle happened was because either Moses' hands were lifted or down. I was even thinking, the Bible said there was a time when Moses' hands were getting weary, started to bring it down. If I was Aaron, I would say, ah, if it's about raising hand, let me also raise my hand and see what happens. But they understood spiritual technology. What did they do? They kept, they made sure that they would even erect things down there to support the man of God. There are men in our life that I can tell you today by authority of God's word that they are not normal men. The moment you begin to identify such men and you honor them accordingly, they have what it takes to be able to change the face of our lives. You see, we've gotten to a point where um, Christianity has come under so much attack. Men of God are being criticized here and there. But I can tell you that there are some solid men of God that God jealously has empowered with his grace. What I can do, I have men of God that would take five seconds to do something that would take me 40 years. May we not take men for granted. Not all men are the same. If you joke with somebody like Jacob, Jacob had the ability to make Ephraim ahead of Manasseh, although Manasseh was the older one. Joseph was saying, no, ah, daddy, you are blind. I'm putting the older one in, at, at your right hand so that you use your right. Even though he did that, this man of God if, uh, went ahead with all his partial blindness. He still crossed his hand. You see, there is, there is a realm that these men of God walk that is not carnal. Joseph was using his carnality to say the younger one must be on the left and the older one must be on the right. He positioned there physically, but the spirit that was upon Jacob had to make him cross his hand. Joseph was saying, why? He said, no. Ephraim, although he's the younger, he will be the greater one uh, between the two of them. And he's saying that I have made him. I thought it was only God who made men. What happened? That somebody can say, I have made him. Why is it that Isaac can say, go and kill um, venison for me and I will bless you. When Esau came and Esau was crying, he said, I have already blessed him and there's nothing I can do about it. There are men in our life that God has put in so much authority on them that they can change our destiny. Abraham was one of those people. Is it not interesting that God said, I will not do anything without telling my servant Abraham. When, when did God begin to bargain with man? It got to a point when God wanted to go and um, destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. God actually had to discuss with Abraham. Abraham had so much stature that Bible said that Abraham stood before the Lord. Do you know what it means to be able to stand before the Lord? You need stamina. So the young ones that are growing up, especially me and the rest of us who are ministers, we need to be careful. Let us honor those that God is using. The final thing that I want to talk about, which is where I like, is the deception of the call. 
Many of us are called, but how many of us are chosen? Bible said that it is very clear. The calling is very clear. I don't doubt that God has, has, has called you. But I want to tell you that there is a difference between being called and being sent. And mathematically, if you are trying to um, put a formula to this, we call something process. So process is the difference between the calling and the sending. That time frame, we call something process. No one is called with an instruction, but we are only sent with an instruction. So man of God, woman of God, I, I appreciate the fact that you can feel the call of God upon your life. The call of God is only inviting you to the place of God. In Mark, he was given an account and he said that God appointed, God ordained, God called 12 apostles. He said to himself that they would be with him, that he might send them away. So the difference between the calling and the sending is what I call process. If you jump process, you cannot survive in this kingdom business that we are talking about. Have you not wondered why a lot of people are recruited into the military? But when they get into the military, when the letters go out there that they are being recruited, what they are called actually is that they are actually invited to go through a process. So a lot of them are invited into the military, but not all of them are able to graduate. Those that graduate are the people that have been able to uh, get their lives chiseled. A lot of fat and chaff has been taken out of their system. They've been, they've, they've been fine-tuned for their assignment, and that is where they are sent. They are sent with what? Instructions. So be careful the way we are shouting that I am called. My pastors will allow me to go and do whatever I have to do. Be careful. It is a trap. The devil can trap you. Make sure that when the calling comes, understand today that it is an invitation to come and be with Christ. When you feel the call of God upon your life, you are being called into isolation. You are being called into a life of loneliness with Christ. That Christ will take you through the process. After you've gone through the process, you will be fine-tuned for the kingdom business. And then God will send you away. Two people that were taught that they had been called. One was Moses. When Moses saw that his brother and another gentleman were fighting, he had the call of a deliverer. He felt that he needed to do something. He went ahead, fought against the other person and killed him. What, what happened? And then the spirit of murder rose up again. He started running away. The call, if you jump with the call, you will activate murder. So he had to run away till God had mercy on him. It took him 40 days for God to train him. After God trained him, this was the word. Now I have made you a God to Pharaoh. So that process that um, Moses had to go through from the time he ran away and to the time that God sent him is what we call process. That time he was given instructions now. But when he felt the call, he felt, I need to deliver my people. There was no instruction. The same thing also happened to a prophet Isaiah. I think um, Doc took about two or three minutes of my time. So let me quickly round it up. Isaiah also had the first pro the, the, the similar problem like, 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 like that. Isaiah had been preaching from Isaiah 1 to chapter 5. Little did he know in chapter 6 that when King, um, in the year King Uzziah died, he went into the spirit. When he came before the celestial beings, he realized that something was different. He said there was an, an angel that had to actually come and purge his tongue. And that was when the prophet Isaiah realized that he was a man with unclean lips. But you've been talking from chapter one to chapter five. And why are you now realizing that you are a man with unclean lips? And that was when God said that there was a call. I'm looking for somebody to send. And that was when he said he will go. So his process was that the coal of fire had to be put on his stand. He was purified of his iniquities. When you jump ahead of God, that means you are only following a call. A call is actually calling you to come close to Jesus. You can be called all right and yet send yourself. And that's where the pressure of ministry creeps in. You can be called, sent, yes, miss your way because you did not stay with God. When God calls you and he's taking you through the process and he even sends you, there are series of instructions that you have on the way. Is it not interesting that when God sends Samuel to go and anoint um, what do you call him? To go and anoint um, um, David. He told him what to do. But Samuel made a mistake because when he got there, he did not pay attention to what God was saying. Because God needed to show him who God said, go and anoint. When you get there, I will show you. But when he got there, he used his physical indices to choose who was tall. Because tradition has made him understand that when God was making me appoint Saul, Saul was the 
um, the tickets and the toilet. So when I get to the house, the one who has the appearance of, um, what do you call it? The appearance of um, that, 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 that soul nature. Let me choose that one. Forgive me about the video. I just want, I don't, I don't want to tamper with it. I'm, I'm almost done. And that is what I want to leave us with today, that it is very dangerous. Most of the young ones today, we are trying to jump process. If you jump process, you will put yourself in the jaws of Leviathan. Don't undermine the fathers who are taking the lead. They carry something we don't carry. There are still some Moseses in our generation. There are still some Abrahams in our generation. There are still some Elijahs in our generation. We need Elijahs that understand the language of fire. We need Abrahams that can defend a territory that they don't leave. Lot was living there, but God had to consult Abraham. We need the likes of Samuel that can intercede for a whole territory. And we need the likes of Paul that can download the technology of God to teach a generation. If we must, can be able to carry this message to our next generation, we need to pray that we will not deceive ourselves. Self-deception is a cancer. Before you realize, you've derailed from whatever God has called you to do. May God bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Man of God, God richly bless you. Um, I was just sitting, sitting down and just soaking the word and uh, the dimension with which you took it, I said, God really bless you. I know you saw the face of God to come out with this because there was something you said about Samuel and Moses. And that was in Jeremiah chapter 15. That I said, even if these two people should come and stand in the gap, I will still do what I want to do. It's mean that God gave reverence to these people in a different light. And, and that was amazing. We all know the same. And there are people that carry extra grace, the people that have saw the face of God, that dedicated their life, and they are with God, and they seek God alone, and God deal with them in a very special way. God bless you for, for coming to bless us with this wonderful word. I know people are listening all over the world, and I believe it's a message that will help everyone that have been called to be humble enough to learn and go through the process and also humble ourselves to seek God for divine directions because it's very important. We are full of energy but maybe the wisdom might not be enough. So we pray that God will see us through so that even that we have all the zeal and all the power and all the energy will still go to God and will still honor the men that have made their way and we pray that God will even make us better by taking the wisdom and also applying it onto our own life. God bless you so very much. This is first day on the call network. Uh, it's been a blessing and it's part of this family. I really want to say we really appreciate you. God bless you so very much. And I know we're going to meet again. Thank you so very much. At this point, we'll call upon our brother, uh, Elder McJoris, all the way from Ghana. McJoris. Good evening. Wow. First of all, Theophilus, God bless you for such a powerful exposition. God bless you. God bless you. I salute all the men and women of God on the platform. Uh, also for Daniel, God bless you for the opportunity. Um, I honor this privilege. And then um, we don't take it for granted. Also for, um, the subject of deception is basically what I call the weapon behind the fall of man. And the Bible makes it clear that it was Eve that was deceived. And Eve in that context represents the church. So the purpose of deception is basically to divert our focus from our eternal purpose. Amen. Um, before we journey into the subject of deception, I want us to read some few scriptures. The first one is in Genesis 27, 22 to 23. And I believe Pastor Theophilus, you know, said a lot concerning this text. So I'll just take a few verse 
that is 22 and then 23. The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And in the verse 23, and, his, and he, did, he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like Esau. And at this point, I begin to ask, if it was, it, if, if it was you, or if, if, it was, if it were you, what would you have done at this point? The voice is the voice of Jacob. But the hands are the hands of Esau. Why? Because the hands were hairy. And the voice represents that of Jacob. Now, Genesis 29, the verse number 25. I'm reading from the Amplified. But in the morning, it was Leah. What sort of trick is this? Jacob ragged and at Laban. I worked seven years for Rahel. What do you mean by this trickery? What do you mean by this falsehood? What do you mean by this deception? Hallelujah. Therefore, I want to begin by saying that Today, there are a lot of leaders in the church playing the roles of Rahel in the lives of believers. We live in the age of quantum leap of information and knowledge without the corresponding wisdom application and sound judgment. Most believers today of the church are very shallow and gullible. Let me put it this way. They are easily deceived. So today, people are using the voice of Jacob and using the hands of Esau to rob people of their positions and their position and their possessions. Today, there are people who are actually, you know, raising the bar of carnality above spirituality. The voice is like Jacob, but the hands of oppression is like the hands of Esau. This is the situation. This is the picture of deception. There are people manipulating others, persuading others with constant information full of deceit and falsehood, representing, you know, the Christ we're talking about. Yet there is a spirit backing them that is from the pit of hell. Deception. They are brood of vipers in the kingdom, calling themselves descendants of Abraham. If you see them from afar, they look genuine, perfect. They look okay, giving out mysteries and deep revelations. Yet, it is for their personal gains. Hallelujah. They dress up in sheep clothing, very calm, yet they are like, they are wicked wolves who are ready to attack people with their persuasive ways. And they are, and they are you, know, you know, deceptive power demonstration just to lure men to themselves. Although what is deception? Deception is a calculated information designed by the enemy through men to misrepresent the truth. Deception is an activity of darkness. 
Deception are the various strategies the enemy is deploying just to mislead Christians into perfection and corruption. Deception. Don't forget that Jacob and um, Rahel, no, Jacob and the mother Rebecca, you know, capitalized on the blindness of Isaac to deceive him. It was because Isaac was blind. That is why they capitalized on him. And the question is, what was Isaac, what was he expected to do? Hallelujah. Remember that the marriage that was given to Jacob was done in the night. And that is why I said deception is an activity of darkness. And according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Bible makes it clear that the God of this world has blindfolded their mind's eye, therefore preventing them from seeing the great light. This is deception. Today, the church lives in total darkness. The church is in darkness. The activities of Lucifer and his agent are swallowing the activities of God in the church. Satan has recruited his members into the church and they are misleading people into distraction. Let us note the following. Deception number one is a sign of the end time. We cannot play with deception. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now the Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time, some will turn away from the truth and they will follow deceptive spirits. So deception is a sign of the end time. We can't joke with deception. That was the reason why Adam fell from the grace of God. That was the reason why the dominion power, authority that was given to Adam to rule and take dominion of the fishes in the, in the sea, of the bears in the sky, and every animal that, that, is, that will cripple on the earth, that power, that authority, that dominionship was taken from Adam through deception. And my question is, what was Adam supposed to do when Eve gave him the food to eat? Deception. Number two, deception also for is empowered by a spirit. In Genesis chapter three, it was a serpent, a communication between a serpent and Eve. But if you get to the B part of Genesis, verse one, it continues. There was a personality behind. There is an altar behind this thing called deception. So for the other day we were discussing and I was telling you that if Jesus is the truth, if Jesus is the way, and Jesus is life, then who is deception? Deception is a, is, is a, is a person. Deception is a spirit. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. This man will come to do the works of Satan into, in, with counterfeit powers and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deceptive, you know, evil deception to fool people and lead them into destruction. There is a spirit behind deception. We can't joke with this deception. Number three, quickly because of time. Deception operates on the wheels of truth. If there is no truth, there will be no deception. So in Genesis chapter three, verse number five, when God came to, you know, 
meet Adam and Eve naked after everything was done. You know, when the, the when the, the, the serpent was communicating with Adam and Eve in the verse five, the, the enemy said to Adam and Eve that if you eat this, you will become like God. But you see, God never told Adam that he was in his image. Also, for the Bible is not just a, a history book for us to be using the mind of historians to interpret. The Bible is a mystery book. And so when God did it, where did he give this information to Adam and Eve? When you continue with Genesis 3, the verse number 23, when God asked Adam and Eve to get out of the garden, God made this statement that now the man has become like us. There are hidden truths in the Bible. And the enemy is aware of this truth. And he will always use this truth against us. He will take you from the known to the unknown. And from the unknown to the known. Number three, number four. Deception is well formulated, well structured, well processed, well programmed, and well designed. The enemy has groomed, trained, and educated people that will come on this deceptive assignment. It is a program. This is what I call satanic pedag uh, pedagogy. And Satan is training people to take us through these methods. Point five, quickly. Deception does not come through ordinary and unscrupulous people. This point is very serious. This thing called deception does not come through ordinary men and unscrupulous people of the society. Men of stature, well-educated, men that are intellectually genius, men that are religiously inclined, men that understand the system. Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 that the serpent was the more craftier. He was more subtle. So the enemy will not use foolish people to deceive us. And this is where we should be very careful. Now look at this. Matthew 16, 23. Matthew 16, 23. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get thee behind me, you Satan. The same Peter whose word upon which the church of Christ was supposed to be built and established, that the gates of hell could not you know, travel over. This same Peter, the enemy, the enemy used Apostle Peter wanting the death of Jesus to be cut off, not permitting Jesus to go and die in place of our sins. This is Peter. Deception will not come through foolish people. It will come. It will come through the people that are suffer. <laughs> you least expect that they will give you, they will, they will, they will come with this deception. So also for one day, I could deceive you. Also for us, one day I could deceive us for us. Because deception will not come through ordinary people, unscrupulous people. It will come through people that you trust. Therefore, let's quickly look at the channels. The channels and then the front runners of deception. Therefore, deception comes through maybe three things. One of them is enticement. Bible says, and if so, if so, Deception comes through manipulation. Deception comes through desire. These are the channels that I think deception may come through. And that is basically what God was telling, Jesus was telling the church that all that is in this world is the last of the eye, the last of the flesh, and the pride of this world. These are the three channels. These are the three channels that deception will come through. Now, quickly, who are the front runners of deception? Wonderful. Acts chapter 20, the verse number 29 and 30. And I read, I know that false teachers, like vicious wolves, 
will come among you. This is talking about outsiders. Will come among you after I have left, not sparing the flocks of suffer. Any pastor, any apostle, any archbishop, any prophet that is always on the necks of the flocks, thinking about himself more than the flocks, is a deceptive agent. Is an agent of the enemy. Anybody that put heavy laws upon the members of the church, anybody who is who is not after the interests of, 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 of the people in church, anybody who is not after the salvation of the souls of people in church is a deceptive agent. Let me quickly move on. Verse 30. Even some men will come from your own group. This is inside. And they will rise up to distort the truth in order to draw following. This is what is happening. Followers. Anybody that is interested in followers more than the salvation of souls is a deceptive individual. Today, the more followers you have on social media makes you a genuine pastor. But there are people in the caves who are preparing to come out. Also, for the fact that you are on TV, the fact that you are on social media, does not authenticate that you are true from God. It's just a matter of time. So there are two front runners of deception, one from the world and two um, in the church. And today I will not center on the world. I want to, you know, talk within the scopes of the church. I want to focus on the church. As of all, the greatest challenge of deception is that it is based on the scriptures. The greatest you know, the greatest challenge of deception, the reason why we are not able to discern, the reason why we are not able to, you know, find out whether this is true or false is that it is coming from the Bible. No wonder when the enemy wanted to deceive, deceive Jesus, he quoted about three scriptures, all from the Bible. So the fact that somebody is quoting scriptures and explaining them does not make the person genuine. There's something, you know, far more than what we see. The first group of, the first front runners of deception, also for, the first group is what I call the scribes and the Pharisees. <laughs> These are the people that preach what they don't do. These are the people we call them the puppets of the land, the gurus of the land. Also, for, I beg to differ. God is a spirit of different dimension that must be known on a daily basis. And these are the people who are using their personal encounters with God to formulate doctrines and teachings and formulate ordinances and tradition and lay burdens upon people. We should stop using our personal encounters with God and using them as doctrines for others to follow. Let's teach the people how to encounter Jesus themselves. We live in a time that we must teach people to encounter people, God themselves. These are the people that Pastor Ross was saying that they are thieves and criminals. They are our robbers calling themselves priests. <laughs> and one of the things that this kind of scribes are doing is that also for, um, Pastor Theophilus was saying something, and I want to come from a different angle. One of, one of the deceptive, you know, um, 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 principle in the church today is this thing called the spiritual fathers. This spiritual father issue is muting the voice of many upcoming, you know, 
upcoming sons, let me put it that way. Ozofo, have you, have you ever thought or have you ever sat down to ask yourself why God kept on telling Joshua to be strong and courageous? It was because of the shoes that he was going to wear. Knowing definitely what God has used Moses to do. Even when God was speaking to Joshua to move and go forward, Joshua was afraid. How can I do this? But God works within times and seasons. The seasons of God differs. And today, there are sons in the kingdom who are defending errors of the fathers. Even when their fathers are going wrong, they can't talk about, they can't talk about it. This is what is happening in the kingdom. This is what is happening in the kingdom. Also, for, let's look at Samuel. Let's look at Samuel. The issue between Samuel and Eli. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 15. Samuel laid until morning. God gave him a vision in the night. Samuel could not open his book of cavity. Samuel could not talk the whole night. Samuel, Samuel laid until morning. Then he opened the door of the Lord's house. And he was afraid to tell the vision to who? Eli. This is the problem. Today, some of the children are aware that their fathers are going wrong. But because of this thing called spiritual father, we can't tell them. But glory be to God that someone gathered the courage and he was able to speak up. It was the season of Samuel. Though Eli gave some directive measures unto Samuel, but it was the time for God to use Samuel. But Samuel was afraid to speak up. This is what is killing the kingdom. And that is why I said, God is a spirit of different dimension. Pastor Isaac will continue to say that. Nobody knoweth God. We are all knowing him. Asafu, this is what is happening. Do you, do, Asafu, do you remember a story in 1 Kings chapter 13, verse number 17, where a young prophet went to a community, you know, on assignment for the Lord. And when he was done, when I read that, that scripture, this is where I got to realize that. Even today, the sons want a confirmation from their fathers before they speak out. When you read the scripture very well, the Bible says, for I was taught by the word of the Lord. That is in verse 17. Now in the verse 18, the man, Please, please, can you hear me? All right. So in the verse 18, the man started saying something. And he said, he answered, I am a prophet also like you. An old prophet telling a young prophet that I am a prophet like you. An angel spoke to me. Listen, an angel spoke to me. But in the verse 17, it was the word of the Lord that came to the guy. But this old prophet, so-called spiritual father in the kingdom, this is what is happening. Destroying the, 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 the mind of God. Remember the, there was a movie or something I was watching, Who Killed Jesus? And I got to realize that it was these scribes and these Pharisees, the purpose of the land, those, those who, who we call the theologians, those who we call the scholars, those we call the philosophers of the kingdom, coming out, propelling all sorts of, you know, uh, 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 a lot of things which will not have anything to do with the source of men. Pre-Adamic age, whatever, whatever. These things will not have anything to do with the source of men. 
And these are the things that people are now teaching. Whilst people are dying and going to hell day, every day. I want to quickly, my time is up. Quickly. The second group of people, also for, these are the people I call the Nicolaitans, the Balaams, and the Jezebels of the church. They are within the church. For these people, money is their God. Today, if you ask a Christian what is his problem about the church, it is about money. And as a matter of fact, today, before somebody becomes your spiritual father, you are supposed to sow seeds. <laughs> so this is what is happening. The sowing of seeds. Before somebody takes you up as, as a spiritual father, there are a lot of people we have visited, but because we didn't sow seed, they don't care calling us. But if you sow seed, they will call you. So for, for the balance, for the balance of the church, they don't care. All they are interested is money. All they preach from Monday to evening is about money. For these people, they are using the Bible as a way of motivating people, inspiring people. They use the Bible to preach on marriage, to preach on business ideas. A pastor telling himself that I was called to preach on marriage. You are a deceiver. You are a murderer. You are a thief. You are an unrobber. How can God give you an assignment to come and preach only on marriage? They use their Bible to motivate others. To talk during business, you know, uh, meetings. That they will quote the scripture. Savings. Joseph saved. And so, and so, and so forth, and so on. This is what they are using the Bible to do. Whilst people are perishing, while people are going to hell on daily basis, the balance of the church. And these people, remember, after Balaam had tried to, you know, um, 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 curse the Israelites, he went on with seduction. Also, seducing spirit is in the church today. They don't care. Whatever you wear, you can wear it. Once you pay tight, they are okay. Once you give big offerings, you, they don't care. And for the Nicolaitans, all that they are thinking about is that no emphasis, therefore, no emphasis is placed on holiness. No emphasis is placed on purity. No emphasis is placed on the second coming of Christ. So you can be in a church from January to December and all they are preaching is 20 steps to make money. The whole year, that is all that they are doing about. That's all they are doing. Imagine Jezebel being a prophet in the church. And today, that is the season we have found ourselves. The Nicolaitans of the church. The Balaams of the church. And the Jezebels of the church. Also, for these are the, 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 the two ways or the two front runners of deception in the church. Quickly, let me wrap up here. Also, for, we must provide solution so that people who are hearing us will know what to do. Just give me two minutes. Also, for, one, the first thing is that we must be filled with the spirit of discernment and discretion. Second Kings chapter 19, verse number 11, it talks about something. Then the Lord said to me, go up to the mountains and meet me. And the Lord passed by and there was a great strong you know, wind that tore the mountains into two and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after this, there was an earthquake but the Lord was not in it. And after this, there was fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And when you look at the ending part of that, he said, but the we need the spirit of discernment. If you are, if you are King Solomon and you are judging the case of 
two people fighting over one child. You need wisdom from above. It is not enough for us to have knowledge. It is not enough for us to have to know the scriptures. It is not enough for us to be listening to truth. It is time for us to discern, have fellowship, intimacy with the spirit. Because if we are supposed to study, then the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Point number two, also for quickly, we must build ourselves in the scriptures. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. And the people of Berea were men of were men who were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. Why? And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. Then they searched the scriptures to find out if what Paul, if this thing that I'm saying, or so forth, if this thing that I'm saying, there must be assessment. You can't just be soaking them. So the people will go back and sit down with the scriptures. He says, day after day, to find out if even what Paul, Apostle Paul, is saying is truth. But today, the believers don't do this. We don't have time for the Bible. My pastor say, my pastor say, what is God saying? And the last thing is that also for, we must put on the armor of God and the armor of light. He said, put on the armor so that you can stand against the strategies of the enemy. And there are about six things that the Bible said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 11 to 18. And I believe that also for, in this end time, the church must come to a place of discernment. The church must come to a place where we can sit down and study the scriptures for ourselves. The church must come to a place where we'll be able to in, have intimacy with the Holy Spirit so that we can download things from God ourselves for our eternal salvation. Watch out so that no man deceives you. God bless you. Amen. 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 Oh, so for my journey. I am, I am full. I am full. Um, you, you, you've managed to, to put so much into, into this few minutes. And um, I can say that you've actually enlightened us in so many ways. Um, we, we are more than blessed. It's, 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 these things are, are the hard truth. It's very hard to say these things in the kingdom of God now. It's very hard to preach about these things. It's very hard to, you know, get people to understand this. And um, when I find men of God who are ready and willing and available and not what you left and right, and will just bring out the word of God just as it is, I believe that our generation, we have a hope. There is a remnant that will stand for the word of God. And as the word of God was like fire in Jeremiah's mouth and the rest were like wood. So I believe this generation, God is going to make us, if only we're going to stand by the word of God. And man, Joris, I want to say that God bless you so much. There's so much that I have to say now, but because of time factor, that I know that God is taking you far. And I believe that God is going to cause you to bring the youth onto God because this is the message that we need. I know our churches will not allow it. Some of our churches will not allow it, but this is the message that ought to be on the radio. This is the message that ought to be on YouTube, ought to be on Facebook. This is what people must hear every day so that you will not be deceived. God bless you so very much. So very much. Really appreciate you. Uh, we'll call our last speaker, Apostle Anoche Samuel Anoche, man of God. You are welcome. Can you hear man of God? Apostle Samuel? Hello. Hello, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, God, God bless us all, us all for us all for my God bless you a lot. God bless you a lot. Um, I'm just uh, out, out of words now. The, the, the message very deep, very, very deep. God, God bless you. God bless you and God bless us of your fellows also. God bless us of your fellows also for that very, 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 very wonderful message that he has given unto us. Uh, touching a little on what the ministers 
have given unto us, touching a little on what the ministers have already given unto us. Uh, I, 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 want, I want to just touch on what uh, Osofo Majority just said, that before we can get deception, before we can get deception, there must be truth somewhere. Deception can never come when there's no truth. I, I want all the ministers, all the Christians on this page to understand. Deception can never come when there's no truth. And whenever you see truth coming, deception will also creep inside. So immediately you hear or see young men, young women, people rising up to the clarence call of God. Then you quickly have to watch out. Be very discerned. And as was often said, that deception can also come in. Now, from the beginning, that's in the book of Genesis. Immediately, God created his own. Immediately, God brought his own, that is man, onto this earth. Deception, that is the person, that is Satan himself, started finding ways and means to enter to the garden, to find a loophole that he can reach man. Not the woman, man. So even though he used the woman, but the target was man. I'm not talking based on gender. I'm talking about the assignment of God. Anytime you hear the word deception, that somebody somewhere is trying to attack the very things that God has structured, the very things that God has placed in line, then somebody wants to attack. And anytime you see deception growing, then God is also searching for people to stand in the gap. And when these people fail to stand in the gap, that is when deception will grow. It is my prayer that this platform called the Core Network will never come down. And we all become very discerning. And we will get souls, not followers, as the man of God said. Souls, not followers. So one, so far as we are in this world, I want all of us to do, so far as we are in this world and we have not yet gone to our father, deception will never cease. I want us to take note of that. Deception will never cease. When you beat deception to yesterday and you beat deception today, watch out for deception tomorrow and the future. You cannot overcome deception today because deception always will come in the new clothing. When you bring sheep into the vineyard, deception will change from a wolf and become a sheep. When you bring lions to stand out, to bring out the word of God, deception will move from the wolf and become a lion. You have to take note of all these things. Other than that, we will miss it. Our ministers of God said something that the God that we are serving, he changes not. True. But the dimensions with which he works are always different from dispensations onto dispensations. Anytime we tackle the truth, anytime we bring God onto this earth, the devil also finds a tool to fight that very same thing that is bringing God. That is where our arsenals must always vary. We must know when to tackle the youth. We must know when to tackle the young ones. We must know when to tackle the elderly ones. Very, very, very important. We cannot pick up this ministry of God. We, we, we cannot take up this mantle of God by neglecting the fathers. It's true. But we cannot also include the fathers solely because if you don't include them, we cannot pick the ministry of God. We should take note of that. We shouldn't take the fathers out. Neither should we take the fathers above what God has given unto us. 
But above all, we should be discerning to know the fathers to bring on board and the fathers to eliminate. We should be discerning enough to be able to know the apostles that will take the message on and the apostles that will also betray Christ. You should know it. They are all part of the apostles of Christ. They are all part. Some will betray. Some will keep up the mantle. Some will even neglect it, but after some time, they will come on board. It is us, our duty, to help those who are positioned to bring up the good news and to also help eliminate those who will try to distort the word of God. One thing that we cannot take out of this battle against deception is prayer. Very, very important. One thing, one thing that we cannot take out of this process of what? Fighting deception is prayer. And we should always be on our knees, always getting the fresh bread of God so that we can feed the people out there with that instant bread that comes from heaven. Other than that, you always feel. If you always have to go for the old, 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 the word of Lord is all, of the Lord is always what? Quick, active, always sharper. There's one thing about uh, knives and sword that we have to take note of. When you see a warrior, especially the old age warriors, those who use swords, they always have a way of sharpening their swords. Always. They have this kind of stone that they sharpen the sword on. They sharpen the sword on. They sharpen the sword on. Always testing the word that we break out with the truth. Always analyzing the truth that we bring onto platforms with the truth himself. Now, we can only fight. Let me put it this way. We can only fight deception, which is a person, by truth, which is also a person. We can only fight deception, which is a person, by truth, which is a person. Because Christ himself in the book of Matthew says something. Because of the elect and because of the deception that will be coming, I have to do something. Other than that, even the elect will be deceived. Deceptive prophets, deceptive apostles, deceptive teachers, deceptive believers, even to the point that those people that God himself has called can even be deceived. That is one, one scripture in the Bible that anytime I read, Charlie, some kind of fear engulfs me. But that same thing also pushes me to do more for the Lord. To the point that even the one that God himself has elected, we should watch out. Oh, my brother, my sister, there's more work to be done. There is more work to be done. I, 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 time is far spent and I will just do a little top up to what our ministers of God did. Just a little top up. Now, anytime you see, if you want to descend and know where decept, deception is growing, check out this word from people. Do not judge. When you start hearing people, oh, don't judge. We are not the judges. God himself will judge us. Then you see that mm -mm, something is coming. Immediately you start seeing that thing. Then you know that deception is coming. Now, let's, let's quickly move to that scripture. That is the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, I read. Or say, judge not that you be not judged. It's true. Judge not that you yourself you will not be judged. So anytime you 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 hear oh the Bible itself has said that we should change that, but that is not the, what the Bible said. You have to continue. Verse two say, for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged, and with the measure you use it will be measured to you. And when you continue, you see that 
it is talking about something that one, you have to first judge yourself so that you get a clearer eye, a very discerning spirit, so that you can see that of others and judge from that angle. So when deception steps in, people refuse to judge. And when deception steps in, people refuse to take instruction from whoever it is coming from, no matter a young person or an old person. And when deception has grown all its horns, then people refuse to take instruction from the truth, the Holy Spirit, from Christ. They will become very deaf to the very truth that is being said day in and day out. Like the knowers, they will rise up, speak, yes, talking to the people, evangelizing to them that there's salvation here. This act can take people, save people from the flood that is coming. But they will be deaf to it. They will even not hear. They will wait till the last day and God himself will close it to them. As we are speaking now, how open are your ears to what is being spoken to you? That's the question. How open are your ears to the message that is coming? And how ready, how ready are you to pick in that word that is coming so that you press one deception that you have to take note of is this. We are doing well now. We are on the court network. Many men of God are coming, giving the good way. The wows are coming like an ambulance. Wow, 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 wow. You preach good. You are doing good. The message is tight, very deep. But there's another deception that you have to watch out from the book of James. Be you doers of the word. Not just hearers, because the hearer who is not a doer, you deceive yourself more than that person out in that world. It's 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 a privilege. It's it's a privilege for us to be part of this network. But the privilege will be worth it if you will do what we are instructed to do. My dear brother, my dear sister. In this ministry, let me bring it this way, ministry of God, the very thing that we think, we think we are doing for God. We have to take note of some few things. As we are judging, we also watch ourselves with clearer eyes so that we pick those logs that are on our eyes so that we can better pick the little specks that are on people's eyes. Don't prepare messages for people by first not speaking to yourself. Never. People are getting lost. People are getting lost. People are getting lost. People are getting lost. Or some of you lost says something. Or some of you lost says something. Many are called, but they have missed their way. So they have not gotten into the point of being chosen. As much, I want to tell everyone listening to this message now, that every message that you prepare first comes to you and you first. Before the next person. Every message that you prepare Every message that the Holy Ghost gives to you. Oh, go and give this message to these my people. Remember that first you are a people of God. You are a person for God. So that, person, that message must advise you first and foremost. Then it will get to the rest. Don't forget that God never called you to save souls to heaven so that you will miss heaven. God never called you to save souls for heaven so that you will miss heaven. Don't be deceived. 
the best joy that can come to heaven is one, one person changing and coming to the kingdom in the vineyard. And that person is you yourself. You yourself, you are first. When one soul repents, the whole heavens rejoice. So as much as we are trying to reach out to others, as much as we are trying to reach out to the people out there, we should not forget that we ourselves, we are needed in the heaven. It is my prayer that every work that we are doing now, you get its merits face to face with the Lord. So that God will hold our hands and say, the little that I gave you, you are able to keep it. You yourself, you came. You are the little. And you are drawing others to come. The best message that is devoid of persecution, that is devoid of darkness, is living a life that is worth what you preach. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill can never be hidden. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but they put it on the lampstand. So that's all the world will see. Let you, not them, let you, your life so shine before men that they may see you, your good works, and glorify the Father which is in heaven. I say it without any shake that God needs you. Never be deceived that the world is perishing whilst you yourself, you have not worked on yourself. We are in the world, but we are not in the world. More people are coming online. More people are being called on the fire because God needs them. God needs them. And God needs you. Just imagine this. Christ coming onto this world. Coming down into this world. Coming to die for us. And missing the heaven himself. How will it be like? So the last message that he gave unto us was even through prayer. He went to pray that if possible, a cup, what cup will get away? The cup of persecution, the cup of that betrayal, the cup of suffering will get out of his hand. But in the last hour, he was able to overcome that deception and said, not my will, but rather your will be done. How many times do we pray and tell God that, Lord, this message, whatever I'm bringing to the people should be by the will of you, but not my will. Many are on the pulpits based on one, knowledge. Two, education. Three, organization. Four, comfort. Five, because of church. Let me repeat that. Many are on pulpits based on the knowledge that they have. Two, the education that they have. Three, the organizations that they join. Four, the comfort that they are experiencing. Five, the affiliations that they have on, with the church. But they are not called. People will quote, lack of knowledge, my people perish. What kind of knowledge? Is it just reading scripts? Just picking up scriptures from other places? Deliver it smoothly. People are heading churches because they have a particular certificate. People are praising other men of God because their churches are well organized. Listen, it's very good for us to get a well organized church. But it is not how organized the physical church is that shows the priority of the word that is happening over there, that shows the power of God. That is working inside that place. It is about how organized Christ is in their souls. Bringing everything to salvation. 
people are praising God based on the comfort that they have around. I am a minister of God. My elders are working. The church members are working. We have trays. We have a, a, a place. We have cars. We have a lot of things that are able to send out far and wide to preach the gospel. Yes, the gospel must get to all the ends. But that person is not having comfort even in the heart. Inside the heart. The, anytime, anytime you, you go in and go and give a message, and after that message, there's this kind of discomfort in your heart. Check out. Go back and go and pray about that message. You are messing up that thing. Let me get you a, a sample of what I'm saying. The other time I was invited to a school, I deal with students, youth. That is what I deal with, to a school. I went there. Very well at line message. In fact, I preached good. A lot of great me. I met a lot of great ministers that day in that institution. It was a, new, a university. Who said the acknowledgement was Charlie? The, 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 the outline, the mode, how you tackle the word was very great. The power of God was great over there. But when I came back, there was this kind of thing inside me that was present. That was present. No, no, no. No, the team that I was given, I exposed it very well. But the next time, I had a little chance, this time not to the whole congregation, I had a chance to meet the prayer warriors, the prayer warriors, who helped for that program to come on. We had about 50 people. So I got there. So I was going up, supposed to go and lead them for an impartation service. But when I got there, then the Lord spoke to me. Man, change all the messages that you are bringing. Speak on music. Let them understand songs. So how? I said, speak on that for me. Then I took a scripture. Then the Lord took me through. Just I just spoke on music. And I spoke about making melodies in our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and final comfort. Actually, after the message, I was not all that comfortable on the outside. But deep inside me, there was this kind of joy. There was this kind of accomplishment. And I left to my place of abode. And Doc, believe you me, about 70% of the people that I went to pray, the leaders came. 50% of the females among them were lesbians. About 70% of the males on them were masturbators. The first message that I brought with all the power pack couldn't bring them closer to me. But this simple message I talk about, making melody in their heart, using Christ as their music inside their heart all the time. Got them. And they came. It, it, it was so strange. They came, ripping, crying. And I asked the Lord, what should I do to say? Just tell them that they should go and sin no more. And they will be okay. And I just told them that. And from that time, whenever they call me, they thank me and thank the God that we save. That they were very powerful. But this was what was eating them up. It is my dear prayer that the Lord will not just make us eloquent in our speeches and our deliveries, but the Lord will make us carry the very power that will help in the saving of souls. The Lord will not even make us deceptive in our own ways, but the Lord will make us truthful in the very things that he teaches us. Whether you are the young prophet or you are the old prophet, never listen to the angels, never listen to men, Confirm what the Lord himself has told you. And you are good to go. Not looking at the numbers. Not looking at how eloquent you are. Not looking at how organized you are. Not looking at the people around you. Not even looking at the platforms that you'll be called upon. But always cherishing the little that the Lord has given you. And always seeing to it that the work is done. And I pray and I know that one day, one day, the crown 
or standing against that deception will be given unto you. God bless us all. Thank you very much. Doctor, over to you. Mm. Uh, my own brother. Um, yeah, that summarizes it. When I do not have words, that summarizes everything. Um, I just thank God for such a time. You know, when we seek the face of God and we pray for speakers, and when they come and they deliver, not because they have knowledge, but they are standing as a pipe and the word of God is just flowing through them. That's what gives us joy. Because um, this message is not a message to jump. It's not a message to just rush through. It's a message for you to relax and, and, and just soak it into your spirit. And it begins to transform. Even as you listen, it begins to transform you. And this was the kind of messages that Paul and Co used to preach that a whole town can say we've given our life to Christ. So we don't have this kind of messages anymore. And, and this, this is what is going on now. From the first speaker, Theophilus, to Marjorie's, to you, these are the kind of messages that I believe that if we keep preaching and we keep saying, our schools will be saved. Our churches will be transformed. Our platforms will be transformed. The, the, the attention will move from ourselves, our ego and our knowledge and our whatever we have, and it will move to souls. All that will matter to us will be souls and how to draw men to God. It's been a wonderful time to be sincere with you. And sometimes I with this message, you just reach all the nations. And I'll just take this opportunity to, to urge everyone, just go to the core network. Um, YouTube, there are so many messages. Even this message shouldn't just rest on you alone. Share it with your friends. Share it with your school people. Just share it anywhere. It's also a way of showing God that you really appreciate what you've heard. In these last days, I was talking to a pastor. I know our time is gone. But in these last days, all we need are prophets that are going to cry like Jeremiah. Even when Ananiah come and say that, I've also heard from God. He said, no, this is what I heard from God. And this is what we'll face. Even if Samuel and Moses come, this is what's going to happen to the land. If we do not return, how many people are going to talk like this? How many people are going to have the boldness to speak like this? Let's forget about the money and the fame and opportunity and the recognition and just stand for Christ. Because if Jesus stood and thought about his recognition and who he was, he would never come down but he brought himself down to die for you and me. And today we are holding the trumpet. We are blowing. People hear the sound. And some of us, we do not even hear the sound that we blow by ourselves. May God have mercy on us. Strengthen us. Empower us for this generation. Wherever you are, I want you to stand like an intercessor in these last days. We will not just preach the word and go. But after this word has been preached, may you go on your knees wherever you are and begin to pray for the generation because there are pastors on this platform. There are so many people who are listening, but our prayer will bring the change. God bless you all for connecting. It's been a wonderful time. And I pray that may God continue to rest his hand upon your life. May you increase in all dimensions of your life in Jesus' name. God bless you. Share with friends and loved ones. And to meet again next week, stay blessed and highly favored. Man of God, God bless you. God bless you.